Hey there, I'm Dustin Lefebvre, Marketing Lead for Decred. And I'm Jake Yoakum, Project Lead. And thank you for joining us today. We're here to take a very deep dive into the Treasury proposal with the author of that proposal. That's going to be Marco Pirabo, New Systems Lead for Decred. Marco, are you with us today? I am with you guys today. Oh my gosh, I'm so jealous. I could never get that facial hair. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Marco, get, give everyone at home uh, a brief introduction of who you are and what you've done for Decred and before. So I've worked on the Decred project from, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, I've worked with Jake for quite a while. Uh, I think it's going to go on 10 years now. So we did a variety of things, pro pretty much all uh, in the security arena. So and we got kind of intrigued with the whole cryptocurrency thing, and so we kind of pivoted from that. I don't want to bore you guys too much with, uh, with my background. What I do now is uh, I typically lead uh, new project development uh, in Decred. So I am the one who uh, started Politea, uh, started uh, DCR time. So I typically am the one that kicked those kinds of things off, get it going to a point, and then get other folks involved and, and help to develop it into uh, something that works properly. OK, great. Well, you just recently passed a Politea proposal to decentralize the, the treasury. Just give us some context on how that fits into the larger project of Decred. So this treasury is, is large, and uh, having a single person uh, responsible for it is, is just unhealthy from, a, uh, from an OPSEC perspective. So we need to put some guardrails around that treasury so that we can use it properly and, and fund uh, the, the projects that we need to do to keep Decred going. So that's mechanically how the treasury works, right? Which is that we don't want to be subject to anyone else getting hit by a bus uh, leading to you know, gridlock for Decred or similar. Um, but how does that fit into the larger picture of say our, you know, the governance work that we've been doing in Decred? Because I, you know, I know that you know, I, I'm aware of, uh, of how it fits in, but I think that it would be instructive for other people to see how it fits. So Bitcoin gamified uh, timestamping. And with that, we could do things like prevent the, the double spend. What we are trying to do here with Politea is uh, create uh, a gamified governance system so that folks uh, worldwide can vote uh, you know, based on stake so that they can uh, do things and come to an agreement, uh, even if it's contentions or not. Yeah, and then, and then, I mean, I guess you have to connect the dots when it comes to spending, right? We can already do things, we can make on-chain decisions with respect to consensus rules, we can make off-chain decisions with respect to spending, but then it, then it comes down to, well, how does the spending work mechanically? And if that's centralized, then we end up in all kind. you know, it's basically, it's, it, we're decentralizing <laughs> things a piece at a time, and, uh, you know, I, the Treasury is an incredibly important piece of that. Well, you could almost argue that it's one of the most important pieces of it, right? Because um, without without a treasury, so without funds, you cannot continue to develop the network. Yeah. And I think we've seen some some other projects fall uh, fall, you know, essentially um, no longer produce or no longer exist because they did not have uh, ways to fund a, a project. Right. And I think actually that decentralizing a treasury is is one of the most essential things of a blockchain. So if, if you don't have funding, you you have volunteers. If the project becomes large enough, uh, somebody's going to scoop in and uh, hire these people uh, so that they can work on, on the project, right? So because these people need health insurance and, you know, they need to pay kids college, that kind of stuff. If you allow uh, a project to be fully run by volunteers, you, you, are, uh, you have a chance of falling into that trap where the core developers all get scooped up by one operation and then they have inherently an agenda. To set out on this discussion, before we dive into the nuts and bolts of, of your proposal, why don't you describe the way uh, treasury payments are currently made via DHG? Well, so the way that works is uh, all, all the contractors uh, create um, uh, invoices every, uh, every month. So those are sent to, to a group of people that will audit them, and the group of people is mostly Jake. Um, so those are then verified against the work done, and, um, and, and if it lines up, then they get approved. And then uh, there are individual payments made to all these contractors that did a lot of work. So, and if it's only a couple of people, that really is not that big of a deal. But, uh, but the amount of uh, work being done is getting pretty substantial. So having a person having to dig through all of that stuff and doing all this work, work by hand, is, uh, is, it just takes a lot of time and it's error prone. Yeah. So, A, we need to automate a lot of this work and take out a lot of this manual labor out of it. So that, that is really one step that, that is tied into this. So then the second part is, is obviously um, 
is to take the power of a single uh, entity to control all the funds. This entire uh, uh, proposal is built around reducing uh, risk and decentralizing uh, more of the entire project. So you're taking sovereignty and, and really pushing it back into the stakeholders, into the ticket holders, um, further decentralizing the project. Marco, can you give us kind of a, an overview of the proposed implementation? Just kind of walk us through how things would work. So it is a little technical, but the idea comes down to... That's, that's why uh, we have Jake don't... here. We've got Jake here to talk to you about all the technical details. Oh, he knows them intimately. So feel so. free. <laughs> you don't even need me here. Uh, <laughs> So, no, so but the idea is, is that we are going to create um, uh, two new consensus, uh, uh, sorry, script uh, opcodes. And with those opcodes, we are going to be able to add and uh, remove value from the treasury. So as we are, right now we are accumulating value uh, into an address and this is going to change and it's going to become uh, literally a treasury thing that's going to be special. So in order to empty the funds out of that treasury, you need to uh, create a, a special transaction that is uh, signed by a special key, uh, and then monthly, instead of uh, so once we collect all the um, so all the invoices from the various contractors, then we will create a transaction that will actually be visible before it is published on the blockchain. So folks can read through it, can see if they agree with it, and then uh, and then they can be ready to vote on it uh, once it's actually is pushed uh, onto the uh, onto the blockchain. And in terms of the voting, something that's worth clarifying here, right, is is that the voting is done on chain for this, uh, you know, for validating this transaction, right? Well, and that is obviously critical, right? So because on chain is where, uh, where where you can actually measure stakeholders, right? And this is also to prevent any gaming from from any uh, any other group. So if we would have made that off chain, then uh, then there's some games that can be played with the with Politea. So uh, so the Politea uh, fo the folks that run Politea could decide to not include the vote, right? And and no one would be the wiser. So they could omit certain things. So it's really uh, done as as a sort of a threat mitigation and, and preventing <laughs> some of, some of the attack surface that we would have. Marco, I don't quite understand that. How how could the Politea administrators suppress votes or make them un invisible invisible to people? So, so there's actually two two parts here that, that are interesting. Um, so let's let's start with Politea. So Politea is actually open, and uh, all the data is pushed to uh, to uh, to GitHub. So you can actually see what actually happens behind the scenes. But if the website would be uh, compromised for whatever reason, right, and people got a hold of that thing, they could uh, modify that data, right? But they could publish fake data. So so this this really is just about guardrails uh, to prevent uh, bad things uh, from get, from getting worse or even happening. So uh, nobody's infallible. Security is, is a mess, right? As everybody knows, there's an entire circus surrounding it. <laughs> and um, bad things happen. So, um, so it, and with this, uh, we can prevent a, a Politea failure from becoming a, a treasury drain. I think that one way to look at this is, is that when you have a centralized entity collecting the votes, like whoever's operating the Politea system, they have the option of omitting votes. So let's say, you know, let's say there's 20,000 votes that come in for something and 75% of them are yes. It is possible for the Politea operator to omit those votes. Now, because Politea is a soft signaling system, that's not such a huge deal. But once, it, but, but once you start talking about transactions, transactions are irreversible. So if somebody were to do the same thing with a transaction, they could, in theory, drain the treasury arbitrarily. So, so if that's an attack vector that you designed the treasury proposal around, is that something we need to be concerned over for normal Politea action? Do, or, you know, can we have confidence in the voting on Politea as it stands? So the answer to that is yes, though. Provided everything is working smoothly, you could uh, at all times prove all the activity that you've done. So in other words, even if something bad would have happened, uh, they could not have uh, pretended that they were you, right? So because there is attribution to all the things that happen. So every action you do on Politeg is recorded, and you can store a record of that that you can ultimately prove you were the one who did that. Uh, and there is no way for anyone else to, to do that. So even though there could be a compromise, uh, it probably would not last very long. But... Um, you got to be paranoid with these things, right? You got to be real careful. And again, we're talking about money here. 
So the decred treasury is pretty large. So it's, it is, you know, something that people want to attack. And we just need to make sure that we have all the possible measures in place. Yeah, and I mean, while there is the possibility of people manipulating things on Politea, we actually go an extra mile and we give uh, signed receipts out so that people can prove that they were censored. So this idea that, you know, censorship is possible on Politea, it is. But in the case that it happens, it can be demonstrated. And so because Politea is a soft signaling platform, you only have so much, you know, of a loss. It's not like, oh my God, like, you know, millions of dollars are missing from the treasury. And so that's, you know, that's precisely what Marco was getting at. Sure. I, I want to take one step back and we were talking about, I guess, are we talking about the corporate entity DHD dissolving and a new wallet um, coming on board that is the Decred treasury? Uh, not a wallet, decidedly not a wallet. <laughs> um, so th this is going to be handled uh, on the blockchain. So the, the payouts are actually going to be handled on the blockchain in a little bit of wallet magic, but uh, the, it, it's not uh, pertinent to the conversation. So, uh, but what's going to happen is, is the way it works now, right, is uh, UTXOs are assigned to public addresses or to, uh, yes, to public addresses. So that is how, uh, how you have value today. So the, this treasury thing is going to be completely different. And that is that you're going to uh, have an opcode that is going to be able to, uh, to put value into that treasury. So there is not necessarily a, uh, a UTXO with an amount associated with it. it is a, it's a complete, completely different thing. Yeah. So and then- uh, it's actually, ahead, it, it actually bears a lot of similarity to Ethereum, if I'm not mistaken, in the sense that Ethereum, instead of using a UTXO-based system, uses an account-based system, which is really right. what we're doing. We're setting up a special account for the treasury, right? That is exactly right. And, and the reason for that is actually uh, quite simple, is that if we would do this uh, UTXO-based it would uh, bloat the blockchain very drastically to a point where mm -hmm. uh, we would need things like super blocks and uh, yeah, that, that was very undesirable. So, and this actually also makes the whole system actually significantly simpler. So, so we did this, uh, so we brought, uh, borrowed the idea from Ethereum to, to, to have this, this account and, uh, and, and we are going to you know, put that into, in, in, into our system to do something along those lines of add with this opcode and remove with this opcode with the, um, the restrictions that it has to be signed by a magical key. Can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, about the magical key and you know, what, the, uh, you know, what the idea is? Is there a goblet of fire? Are there gremlins? <laughs> are there wizards? How are we going to turn this into a series of boring movies that are pretty much all of the same? The, I, I gotta say though, so um, and, and I know you recall this, Jake. Is that we, we there was a pretty lively debate on uh, using a key or not, and and I think that ultimately everybody wants the key to die in a fire, uh, the goblin of fire, the goblet of fire. I mean, uh, the the reality is is that uh, if you allow everybody to create a transaction, that that it could be a drain on the on the treasury if people are not paying attention. So, so the one thing that I want to say about it, the thing is actually formally known as the uh, the draft key. So that's the the key that signs a draft transaction. So, but the idea uh, that we have in the longer term is to see if we can actually eliminate it. And um, but software development is hard, blockchains are hard, consensus is really hard. So we, we need to do this do this in, in baby steps. So step one is uh, remove the one person that is uh, that is responsible for all the payouts. So how do we do that? What is the simplest mechanism that we uh, we can do that with? And that is what this proposal actually is: is, is uh, taking the HG out of the equation and uh, giving really the power of the purse to the stakeholders. So the worst thing that can happen, the biggest attack surface that we have, is that a transaction would not be uh, put up, right? So in other words, there's nothing to vote on, and you cannot do any payments. So. Um, so then the recovery from that is, is that uh, you can vote in a new uh, key. So and therefore you can actually take the power away uh, from whomever got the private key if, if that person was misbehaving. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, from, from a threat model perspective, what the goal was with, you know, with adding this key was to prevent people from arbitrarily trying to drain the treasury or 
from a small subset of the stakeholders from trying to drain the treasury. You know, the idea being, oh, we all collude and then we drain the treasury. So, to, you know, in a way, this, uh, you know, the draft key acts as a, uh, you know, a mechanism to prevent people from going, you know what, I want to just spend the treasury. Or when no one's looking, they create a draft spend and then drain the treasury. So that, you know, draining the treasury is, is almost a, pro you know, it's a, on the order of a project ending or very serious, very seriously negative event for the project. So we want to do everything we can to try to prevent that, right? Yeah. So, and actually, we, we are going to put some additional guardrails on there too. So you can only spend so much uh, decred a month. And the idea we have right now is 100% of what came in this month plus 50% of the prior month. So in other words, if something bad would happen, uh, then the, the, the maximum drain would be 150% uh, of what came in. So bad, but not project ending. Uh, so the other thing that we also are going to do is put a limit on how many uh, transactions can be up on the blockchain uh, for voting. So in other words, we are going to try to do only one a month. There's some details there, um, but that is the idea. So only allow one transaction a month, only allow a maximum draw, and sign the whole dang thing with a special key so that people can see if something bad is happening. A lot of people would say this falls short of full automation, which I think you know you see in Dash. Um, so how is Dash different, and what are some of the reasons why Decra didn't go that route? Let's see. So the way the Dash system works is that their proposals are on chain, right? So the right. proposals are on chain, and once they're voted on on chain, they have a payment schedule attached to them, and it's automated. So if you know you get 100 dash at the end of you know at the beginning of some month or on some payout you get that irrespective there's no one there you know uh, checking all of the work it is possible in principle to stop it but what we've done is is that we've opted for a system that's you know that the payment aggregation part and then the payment validation and the work checking is soft that's done you know manually you pretty much have to do it manually so you know, I guess that that is a big difference between, say, how Dash works and how you know, and how Decred works. I feel like you almost have to do that from the perspective of getting the work done. Uh, when you create automated payouts, you it sets you up to be gamed by people who can trick you into making the automated payouts and then not doing either either doing subpar work or not doing the work in you know in its entirety. And I can speak to that after having uh, done a, a, you know a number of construction projects in my life at this point. Where if you know contractors will gladly have you pay them up front, and then they won't do the work, or they'll take forever to do the work, or the work will be crappy, and so it's important to withhold payment, and so that you know that right. it becomes clear once you build one piece that it's like, well, some people are going to try to game this. Yeah. Again, that's one thing that Decred does not put out there often enough is that we are more iterators versus big bangers. So we we are conscious that you know that this stuff is hard and that mistakes will be made. So in order to get this right, you have to do the smaller steps and you have to try out and see what works and what doesn't work. So, and that is what this, this proposal is also doing, right? It's, it's, a, it's an iteration that is going to make it better. And we have some ideas on how to make it better afterwards, but you know what? We don't have the realities right now in hands to, uh, to see where that, where that is going. So the, the, the tri this proposal is, complex enough that it's going to take months and months to write and to mostly to test. And while we are writing that code, while we are testing that code, that is when we are going, a lot of realities will become apparent. And, and if you're a big banger, what happens is, is that those realities uh, sometimes don't fit your ideas, right? And now what? So this allows us to be a little bit more agile uh, in the future and, you know, and then make it better yet again. Do you have any ideas that you could, or be, that you could share today on what the possible next steps would be? For iteration, well, iterating this. So from a uh, from a want, uh, I definitely want the key to go away, right? I, right? I would prefer that that somehow becomes done by the stakeholders again, so that the stakeholders somehow are uh, allowing this. But in order for that to happen, um, so I don't know if we talked about this a lot, but we have a, we are building a CMS system, so a contractor management system, and that is going to drastically help collecting all this information that's actually going to ultimately feed into this transaction. So once that is written, once that happens, and once we played with the, the parameters a little bit, uh, you know, the realities are going to become known, and then we are going to be able to, uh, you know, probably going to be able to, you know, engineer that key out of there. So, um, so that would be my first thing to go do. The other thing that I do want to go do, and Jake is hesitant, and I agree with him, 
But again, if, if we do this properly on the CMS side, is maybe we can start doing uh, automated payments or partially automated payments. I have had some payments go very, very wrong in my life. You know, like say you pay a law firm a lot of money up front and then they don't do the work or they sit on it and they drain the account and claim they did work that they didn't do. And it's like, do you really want to sue a law firm and claim they didn't do the work they said they did? Um, or, you know, you give a big lump, you know, a lump, a lump sum payment to a contractor and it's like, do you really want to chase this person down and beat them with a stick until they do the work? And so I feel like the automation of payment is one of these things that I'm very, I'm very twitchy about just based on my own life experiences. But, um, you know, to, to circle back to the key, something that I think that, you know, uh, you know, that we discussed in the context of the key is actually a similar threat model to what Bitcoin, uh, you know, experienced, where the argument to not have larger blocks uh, revolves around things uh, related to where your machines are going to live. Because if the blocks get really large, the only place you can reasonably have a full node is in a data center. And that really Ooh. restricts the number of people who can operate a node, and then it also makes it just much more centralized. Anyone who's familiar with data centers, like me and Marco are, uh, is fully aware that data centers are full of people who are government employees of various sorts. And that brings into question how secure is any machine that's actually in a data center. And unfortunately for us, uh, you know, uh, as a function of, say, the, the voting service providers, a.k.a. stake pools, a lot of those nodes operate in data centers. So the voting sovereignty, a lot of it is in data centers. So in theory, and I say in theory because it would require a lot of coordination and action, it's theoretically possible to seize those machines and vote, uh, you know, and vote those tickets. So we almost need the the Politea draft or you know the uh, Treasury draft key to prevent that threat from becoming you know from materializing. And something that could really help us you know get to the point where it would make sense to get rid of the key would be we get the voting service providers out of data centers so that mm -hmm. people are casting votes from you know uh, property they control on machines they control as opposed to in some air conditioned place where people can walk through the walk through the racks and hit a button and compromise your machine. Do you see a reasonable path to that? Well, I mean, I, I you know, I, I just suggested it, which is, which is, we get the voting service providers out of the data centers to some extent. I think actually the, the best thing to do, or the easiest thing to do, um, uh, painful development-wise, but that is automating the setup. So if we can generate a, you know, three, four-button uh, setup mechanism to get this going for people, that would drastically uh, in increase the chances that somebody would do this themselves. So I think by making the software simple to be used, we could actually solve some of these problems as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you uh, with respect to automating it because the real reason people use voting service providers is because it's it takes a little bit of sysadmin skills to set up a voting wallet and maintain it on an ongoing basis. It isn't very difficult, but you know, not not everybody has the confidence and the chops to do that. Right. Well, so another thing actually that we haven't talked about that's also in the proposal, which is going to uh, help finding some of these things, is audit tools. So we are going to write some tools that are going to be running in the wallets, uh, so like the Crediton or DCR wallet. And what they're going to do is they are going to verify that the way you set up your voting bits is actually how they are being voted. So, and that will help, uh, you know, uh, raise alerts if, if somebody is uh, being defrauded of their vote. Um, and, and, and with that, that is actionable information that then can be put out to the community and then maybe something can be done about that. And people can start voting against, for example, a fraudulent transaction. Yeah, and I mean, currently we just don't have that infrastructure in place. So as that infrastructure starts to get built out and put in place, we can, you know, more confidently do things like what you prescribed, which is remove the key from the uh, from the treasury spending process. Right, and and we are back at baby steps. Yeah, I mean, I expect to see more movement on this in about, you know, I'd expect a month or two, um, and just like everything else. I, th I feel like it's it's important to put proposals up to manage people's expectations, but when it comes to development, particularly in cri in the cryptocurrency context, you can't screw around. You know, you can move fast and break things in other in other you know software domains, but it's very easy to go, oh, we're just gonna move fast and break things, and then you know the whole block, you know, things will explode and it's it's unrecoverable or the exchange rate craters. So you know, we're trying to you know we're we're trying to do things one at a time, and unfortunately part of the territory is dealing with, oh, we thought that was going to take two months. It actually took four or five or six. So th th right, this, yeah. this so happens actually, all the time. Software development is, is obviously hard, so it starts there. But, um, but another thing is, is that consensus is really hard, right? There is, there is no room for mistakes there. 
So uh, I, I would, I would, you know, if I just, you know, uh, if I have to pull a number out of the air. So I think that for every consensus line we write, we probably have 50 or 100 lines of test code associated with it. So even though these things actually may seem very simple to do, the amount of test code that we are actually going to write is going to be, you know, 10x uh, the size of the code that we are going to write that actually does all the work. Something else to remember about consensus code is, is that, you know, everyone, everyone, including me, Dustin, you, all of us have shower thoughts. We're like, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do X? And the unfortunate reality is, is that, you know, if it was so easy to do whatever our shower thought was, somebody would have already done it, right? Yep, that's that's absolutely true. I have a lot of shower thoughts, man. If I, if I could make some money with that, that would be great. <laughs> no, but there's this whole re, there's this whole reality of um, of doing the work, right? So so I, I like to always say uh, one woman nine months, and that's the reality of software development. So um, so you cannot paralyze a lot of these things, especially if you're doing some very highly specialized work, which we are in in consensus. So it it just takes literally one person to write a whole bunch of code, and it takes five people to actually troll that code and uh, make sure it's written properly. It's a complica complicated task. Yeah. So and with crypto, it's, it's good when it's good. And you know, up until then, it's not good enough. There is no such thing as uh, good enough in, in this space. We don't want a repeat of the DAO uh, spend exploit, right? We don't want, it's like, oh my God, they're draining the treasury. It's like, we don't want to be in that situation. So to do it right, you know, it takes time, energy, and effort that you know, other people have thought in the past they could skate on, and apparently they can't. Well, and if you make something too complex, guess what? It's going to break in complex ways. So, um, and I think that's actually what we saw with the DAO. Marco, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for your openness and, and your transparency with, with the process, with the iterative nature of it. Uh, I think that this is something that, that other projects don't talk about, and, and I think it differentiates Decred because you know we're, we're not you know, waving our hands and saying, you know, this is perfect and marketing this and that, but we're actually sharing, you know, the steps that are being taken that need to be taken to decentralize the project further. Uh, and, and we're lucky to have you guys on here. So thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks I, for the I work you do. That. Oh, thank you. No, I do appreciate that. And, and actually, if I may, for five seconds. So there was, there were a lot of questions and a lot of them were uh, step two, three, and even four and five uh, work. So and like I said before, you gotta you know you gotta figure out all this stuff first before you can even begin thinking about doing those those new steps. So uh, so that, that's always a message you'll hear from me. Baby steps of software development. Iterate, iterate uh, you know, fail fail early and fail often. That's how you get good software. All right. Well, our minds are already elsewhere. <laughs> um, but thanks for joining us today on Deep Dive with Marco Pierboom, new systems lead over here at Degrad. Uh, I'm Dustin LeFevre, marketing lead. And Jake, Jake Yoakum Pyatt, Project Lead. Until next time.